All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the third day of the online forum on modern direct democracy. So just an update from our, from our side, we've been having sessions. Uh, this is a, this is the session we're going to have right now is the seventh uh, session in, um, of the of the forum. And um, if you want to have a look at what we've been doing and what we've been discussing up to this point, you can feel free to uh, feel free to visit our website. Uh, there's a if you go on the homepage, you'll see a tab. It says online forum happening right now, and there you can see um, you can see a chronological um, summary of of all the and also the videos of of all the discussions. Um, so then we're also going to be having it continuing until the 29th of September, the global forum. So please feel free. You're more than welcome. It's been great up to this point, and just join us for further discussions. It's going to be um, we look forward to to having you. Now, um, just some technical issues before we, um, before we start or some technical points before we start the session. Uh, you can, if you, if you want to raise your hand, you can do that by clicking on the participants uh, tab. And then if you click on it, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And then also you can just directly type your questions in the chat. Just connected to this, um, we have a code of conduct, which means uh, please refrain from any, you know, forms of, of um, you know, let's say behavior that goes against the code of conduct. I'm sure you'll be able to, to um, you, know, understand, you know, also understand that yourselves, that it's basically anything that's hate speech, discrimination, etc. And um, we don't really, we don't want that at all um, at, in, the, in the chat or in this discussion. And now, um, yeah, firstly, I'd uh, like to, uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome Urban. Uh, Leitner from Mehr Demokratie um, Austria and it's a direct it's a NGO that is campaigning for more direct democracy in uh, in Austria and uh, then also our guest today um, expert is Katharina Rogenhofer and um, yeah so now I'd like to give it over to Irvin who's going to um, yeah tell us a bit more about Mehr Demokratie and then he's going to give the floor also to Katharina okay Irvin over to you Hello, Irvin. Uh, you're muted. Uh, sorry, Irvin, uh, you're just muted there. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the online forum on modern direct democracy. We are now in a, a track about uh, climate and system, system benefit sustainability and direct democracy. My name is Erwin Leitner. I'm founder and uh, speaker of More Democracy Austria. We are together uh, with more, uh, the More Democracy family uh, from Germany, Luxembourg, and also uh, with a network of Democracy International organizing this uh, online uh, forum on modern direct democracy. Uh, we, the family of more democracy, mehr Demokratie organizations, we are in favor of um, strong direct democracy. We are fighting for um, binding referendums that can be initiated um, by the people. Today, we will talk about uh, the Austrian Citizens Initiative uh, on climate. And let me just say a few words about the citizen initiative uh, in Austria. In Austria, we do have um, direct democratic instruments on federal level. But I always try to point out that we do have the wrong instruments, the wrong set of instruments. Why? Uh, because the strong instruments, the binding referendum, can only be initiated top down by the government or by the majority uh, of the parliament. And the instruments, the instrument which can be initiated uh, bottom up by the people, is a weak one, is a soft one. So uh, the city citizen initiative, uh, about which we are talking today, is a um, soft instrument which does not 
lead to a referendum nor to an unbinding consultative referendum. It's just more or less a mass petition towards the parliament. From time to time, I am asked uh, if all the efforts are worth uh, to uh, make an Austrian uh, citizen initiative. And my answer is, it always depends. If you make a good campaign, uh, then it is worth to do that. And of course, um, a citizen initiative always needs to be embedded in a good campaign. On the two days, um, the citizen initiative on climate, about which we will talk today, is a very good example uh, where uh, we saw a very good uh, campaign and uh, it can be uh, very inspiring uh, also for other um, initiatives or other campaigns. It is a pleasure for me now to introduce Katharina Roggenhofer, who was uh, the coordinator of uh, the Citizen Initiative on uh, Climate. Uh, she uh, is also uh, she also initiated the Austrian movement of uh, um, Fridays on Future, and she started in Austria and in Oxford. Um, Katharina, please tell us what is your story? How did you come? How did you become a climate activist? And please tell us the story of. Um, the Austrian Citizen Initiative on Climate. Katharina, the screen is yours. Um, thank you, Erwin, for introducing me and um, welcome to all participants. I'm happy to speak here and I hope that we will have a lively discussion afterwards. I prepared some slides and some, yeah, I will talk for I don't know, probably half an hour, but I will give um, enough time and space for questions as well, because I, I'm super interested in what you have to ask me or what inspirations you bring from other countries maybe. Um, so yeah, let me start. Uh, Erwin introduced me. I'm My background is in natural sciences. I studied zoology and then biodiversity conservation and management in England. And um, so I knew relatively early about the state of the earth and uh, the cur current climate science um, was unknown to me, but I never considered getting like into politics or becoming politically active before 2018. Um, and I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I will start with um, a short introduction into uh, the climate science of today so that we are on the same page. And then I'll uh, lead you through the story and how I became active and the Klimafolks began the Citizens Initiative in Austria as an example of how people then became active in Austria. And I'm sure it's similar in other countries as well. Um, so I'm sure that you are aware of um, something called the greenhouse gas effect. This is the reason why the earth is warming and with um, the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere, um, heat is trapped in, inside the atmosphere and um, the world warms. And the, the warming that we see today is one degree um, above the average of pre-industrial levels. It's even more in Austria. In Austria, we see two degrees of warming at the moment. And um, this leads to different things. For example, now we can see in California, the forest fires, but also in Siberia, it leads to floods, droughts, wildfires, extreme temperature events all over the world. Um, we see that um, the Arctic ice melts more than ever before. 
um, Siberia sees 38 degrees Celsius, which is um, insane for such a northern um, hemisphere. And this all brings me to the point that um, we all know, or scientists know for a long time, that the climate crisis is here. And the question is how to react to this reality. And I worked for the U UN for a couple of months. Um, and I thought, uh, I initially thought that this would be the space where the big decisions happen. Those are 193 countries getting together on the, on the big um, level and decide on uh, what is going to happen to our climate. But I, sh I very quickly became aware that this is not where ambitious climate action takes place. I'm not at all against the UN. I think the UN has a very important role, but it's not the role of the front runner. And we need to be front runners now. So I, um, at the climate conference I was at, that was Katowice in Poland, 2018, which was also the first climate summit where Greta Thunberg was, and I am sure you all heard of her. Um, and this was the first time that her speech in front of the UN went around the world. And it was also the same time that I decided with two friends to um, initiate Fridays for, Fu uh, Fridays for Future movement in Austria. And we started on the 21st of December, 2018. And this was a very cold day. We decided to go outside. We, nobody of us had ever planned a demonstration or a strike before. So we just went to the police and asked them, how, how, how are we going to do that? How, how is that set up? Um, and we did the first strike. We thought it would be very um, intelligent to strike for six hours. Um, on the 21st of December, that was not a very clever idea. <laughs> so we, um, it ha it's, it's been very cold, but um, that then exploded. And I don't know about your countries, but in Austria on the 13th, um, on the 15th of March, 2019, that was the first, um, the first big uh, strike in the world. There were 25,000 people alone on Heldenplatz, um, which is the main square in, 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 in Vienna, the capital of Austria. And I'm quickly just going to show you a picture of that. Wait a second. I have to find how I can share my screen. Here. And now I have to. Oh. Huh. How can I? So now. So this was the um, 15th of March 2019. And the Fridays for Future, um, this was when the Fridays for Future movement in Austria took off. And it was unbelievable how many people came and joined the movement. And Evan um, also said that after that, I went to um, coordinate a Klima Volksbegehren because not only inside the Fridays for Future movement, but I think in general, we were aware that this huge movement was such a game changer, also in Austria, in the way that people discussed the climate crisis, in the way the media portrayed climate crisis. But we also wanted to take a step further and go and, um, yeah, and bring our issues forward to parliament, to politicians, in order to also change legislation in the best case. So we started, the Klima Volks began, um, what is the folks began just for you to quickly um, yeah get get on the same uh, <laughs> get on the same page as as, as we are uh, it's an agenda setting initiative or a citizens initiative as we call it um, for this talk which means that it's a motion that if it's signed by 100,000 voters can be submitted to the national council for action and there are two very um, important words in that it's only voters. So th those that are eligible to vote 
can also sign a Volksbegehren. And it's not a petition as petitions, you can also sign just on the streets and you can run around the collecting signatures. Um, this is not the same thing. You actually have to go to your local authority to sign it, which may even harder to collect those many signatures because people actually have to go somewhere. But if you surpass so, so this line, then um, your issue will be discussed in Parliament. And the popular initiative must concern a matter by federal law because we have different um, uh, levels of law in Austria, but it must concern federal law. Um, and it's the only national direct democratic tool. I mean, uh, voting is also a direct democracy, but uh, a popular initiative, this is the only one. As Erwin said, there are other instruments, but they can only be put forward by the authorities themselves. So now I'm going, oh, sorry. Um, what, what did we want? We wanted, um, for example, for the, <laughs> uh, of course, political change, but we put forward um, some demands that I'm just going to lead you through. One was a right to live in an intact environment. We wanted to, we want to put that into the constitution. So, um, that people actually have the right that the state acts upon climate or other environmental purposes and to install a right for every person to live in an intact environment. The next demand is staying within our remaining CO2 budget. Those are more than this demand. It also consists of a, um, creating a yearly CO2 budget um, for the states, but also um, for each sector and being and that being monitored by um, by something like an audit uh, uh, audit institution uh, that is not looking at our monetary budget but our CO two budget. We want an ecological and social tax reform. We want um, more renewable energy. There are several renewable energy demands, and of course. Um, a change in transportation, so um, uh, more public transportation, uh, less uh, pollute, pollution in cities and, and stuff like that. And we work through that um, with many climate scientists in Austria, with many um, initiatives and, and NGOs to get on the same page on what we want as an initiative, but also what the current climate um, the current climate science in Austria tells us would, what would be the best things that put, would be put forward for such an initiative. Um, we were very small at that point of time. So we were just some people that had the idea to put forward such a motion. And um, normally what you see with Volksbegehren is that they are put forward by an existing organization, for example, Greenpeace, or even a party, because they have the funds to do it, they have the networks, they have um, the knowledge of how to create a good campaign. As Erwin said, that, that's a very uh, important thing that you have to uh, consider if you plan something like that. But we were totally new in the scene. Um, so it was important for us to first, after we made sure that our demands were in line with the current climate science, uh, we wanted to build up alliances. And um, for those alliances, they actually, that worked pretty well at that time. So at the end, when we collected the signatures, we were more than thousand volunteers. We had more than 60 organizations that helped us we had more than 130 celebrities and artists that um, also supported our claims. And we had more than 200 companies also supporting us, um, mostly not monetarily, but with their networks and, and, and what they could um, support us with. Very important for us was also to leave the bubble so normally what you would have in such initiatives that 
you you are supported by for example greenpeace and other environmental ngos and they of course communicate to an audience that is more likely to sign the petition or to sign the popular um, initiative but we had to aim higher and also our um, our goal was not only the signatures but to also um, bring our demands and uh, information about the climate crisis to more people than just the bubble that was al already informed. So we wanted, um, we especially had, um, we targeted or we had meetings with various religious groups, uh, with labor unions, um, as I said before, celebrities and artists to also broaden the people that we could um, reach and could could speak to. Uh, we went to companies. Uh, we uh, yeah we ne we networked with youth organizations. Uh, we had alliances with local change makers and local governments, so that it also took down to the local states um, scale. And I'm just going to show you some of the pictures again, if that's possible. I think Rainer, you have to again. Oh, perfect. Mm. Here. Yes. Um, so yeah, those are the religious groups, the six biggest religious groups, um, the head authorities of those six biggest religious groups in Austria, all of them supported our claims. Um, the current and the former first ladies uh, who, who are still like those are, that are still alive. Um, companies have signed an open letter to the government. Um, over 200 companies signed our, um, our demands. We, of course, like every other initiative, did street campaigns um, in various places in all of Austria. We had groups in, um, in every uh, in every federal state, but what is Evan? Do you know what um, Lenda is? <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, so, so we did street campaigns. Uh, we also had one campaign for those wh who are not eligible to vote, who are under sixteen or not from Austria. We let them put their hands on paper and and do a handprint. Uh, in order for them also for, for them to show their solidarity. And we will show this um, at the time that the, the initiative will be discussed in Parliament. We want to really show the support as well from those that were not eligible to sign the petition. Um, we did information events in, in, in various places outside, inside, in companies, in schools, in universities. Um, we also had actions prior to governmental decisions. This is one picture of us where we, together with Greenpeace and Fridays for Future, um, put pressure on our local government um, at that time to invest more into the climate, uh, which was also successful. I don't know if just um, because of us, but uh, after that summit, they actually um, put forward a motion for um, a billion that is invested in climate each year now. Uh, we also did a campaign that we called Voices of Climate Change, where we wanted to pr portray um, normal people outside there, like farmers, um, people who, uh, who work with tourism, uh, land out boats, hikers, um, uh, if, yeah, people who work in forestry, pensioners, um, and portray how they are affected by climate change. Um, because we wanted to show that the climate crisis is not something that um, we can only talk about in terms of the Arctis ice, the, the Arctis ice uh, sheet melting, um, wildfires, although they are horrible and we should talk about them, it's also affecting people in Austria. And those stories actually became 
quite popular and they were shared a lot. So we did, of course, also a social media campaign. And um, we then, with all of this, we, we collected 380,590 signatures, um, and which means that it has now, has to be now discussed in parliament. Um, we don't know when yet. Uh, so this is uh, to be announced in the next weeks. Probably, uh, most probably it will be discussed at, um, at the beginning of November. And now our main goal is to have talks with the politicians in order to make the implementation of demands more likely. Because um, as Erwin said, there is no binding on the things that we put forward. So we also cannot put motions forward. This is all up to the parties um, to do. So our main work at the moment is working on specific texts of law and motions as service for the parties and doing our best um, to, yeah, to, to make them act in our favor. Uh, we also had, have info materials for all parliamentarians and we now will design a campaign that is also targeted towards the public but also towards the parliamentarians in order to build up pressure um, and hopefully get them to put forward motions and also to change le legislation in a way that is in line with our demands. I will stop that now again. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is this is the whole story. I hope it was not too fast for some of you, but um, I just wanted to show you some pictures and some some thoughts that we had with the campaign. Uh, I think that one of the most important things for us to was to have those this big network of alliances and also to probably yeah uh, get get out of the bubble somewhat and try to um, talk to groups that were not priorly um, in the climate movement or not as tied to the climate movement as um, some environmental organizations would have been and I think in in Austria the the it was a very hard uh, hard way to come here because when we collected signatures the first wave of the COVID pandemic started which made it relatively hard to do a good campaign and to be also visible and um, uh, yeah active on the streets and as I said before you can I mean there is a possibility to also sign online if you have a phone signature it's called but this you also just get if you go to your local authorities so one way or the other you have to go to your local authorities first which in a global pandemic was a big problem so for that uh, we are actually really we are really happy with um, the outcome of of the klima fox began and i think the second thing that um, maybe for the context we should not forget is that we, um, as Klima Folks began, we exist since one and a half years. And in one and a half years, we had three different governments, um, which is super hard <laughs> because you always have to, um, to gear to the new situation. Before that, um, at the beginning of, our, uh, of, of, the, of the climate initiative, it was, um, the Conservative Party uh, with together with a relatively right winged party that were our government, which of course has a very different feel and is a very different targeting from now that we have a very, con the, still the Conservative Party of Austria together with the Greens and also motivating people to vote on um, on such a popular initiative is not as easy as as you would imagine if you have a green party in your government because many people then think well there are 
people in your government that are green and that are for climate and why should I sign a petition now? Um, which is fair and they're doing more than the previous governments, but they're not doing enough. And I think this is relatively hard to get across in a campaign um, where you have, I don't know if you've ever uh, designed a campaign, but you don't have so much time to get people convinced to sign your thing. And, um, and then you can't be uh, too long in your explanations of why it is not enough what they're doing. <laughs> and, um, and this was also a hard thing for us um, to, to come across. And another thing, uh, was also for us that, um, of course, the attention and the, the, the way that the media wrote about it changed during that time. Uh, with the pandemic, everything was about the pandemic and the climate crisis was very, very, um, a very popular and, and, and very discussed before that. And I think this is thanks to Fridays for Future and the whole worldwide movement. But this sort of um, was took, taken over by, by the global COVID pandemic, which was very, a very, yeah, very hard for us also to get through with attention on climate. And I think with that, I'd just like to um, thank you all that you um, set through the introduction and I I would be super happy to discuss your questions and your issues or also hear from um, probably from other initiatives all around the world. I, I think, um, yeah, I think, I, think I, I just want to end here because I don't know what you are interested in and I can go further into details on things that you would like to know. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I will, I think a lot of people are um, going to start asking questions, but I just like to open the floor and ask. Um, so you mentioned, you know, you started in the middle of the, of the COVID-19 period, and um, I want to find out what were the strategies that you employed to get this amount of people? I mean, it's quite a lot of people that signed it, 380,000. How did you manage to gather the signatures? What were the strategies that you employed to do, do a lot of online uh, so what did you do to, to succeed? Um, we changed a lot of our strategies during um, or with the COVID pandemic, because before that we wanted to do a lot of street campaigning as well, um, because we had so many volunteers from all over Austria and we wanted also to get in contact with people and talk to people and discuss um, this more. But we switched to a more online focused campaign afterwards and I think for this um, most that the, the game changer that uh, was that we had a lot of very good small little videos that also showed Austrian people with their dialects in their hometowns and how they were affected I think that this was a real game game changer and also the support by celebrities um, because I think this is also how we um, we came through to people that we would normally not have been able to target through social media because those celebrities then talk to um, the normal print media about our issues and and people that follow I don't know their favorite actor then then heard from him to or her to sign it and I think. Um, what would what was most important for that strategy because I think we we alone would not have been able to stem um, an online campaign with our following because we I mean we have now a quite big following um, in 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 an Austrian perspective but we are not nothing compared to um, the big organizations also in Austria so it was very important that they at the same time targeted their audiences with our messages. And I think this kind of, um, th this campaigning together was, was a very important thing. Thanks for your answer. Um, yeah, very interesting. And um, 
I have another question here from Jonathan Victory, and he said he's actually prepared to speak on camera. So, um, Jonathan, over to you if you'd be willing to, uh, if you'd want to ask your question uh, yourself. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it was, it was just interesting that um, in Ireland we just had an election where the Green Party, part of their manifesto was to introduce a citizen initiative process in Ireland, but in negotiating to enter government with right-wing parties, I think it was something they compromised and on they're not pursuing now. So I think I was curious about how Austria ended up having the citizen initiative process in the first place, like when that was introduced and like what what it takes for having the political will to get it introduced to it. Um, so I just start quickly and then, then I'll give over to Erwin because I think um, on the history of political instruments, he's, he's more the guy than I am. Uh, I just applied the existing instruments that we have. Um, but as Erwin said before, I think it's not um, the best that you can have. The best, uh, the best instrument that you could, could have as, as public would be something that would either lead um, to a binding decision on something or even a popular vote on something or, or whatever. And this is not the case in Austria. So we only can bring um, demands forward, but we don't know what, like we can't um, really influence what happens with them. But I think uh, what is interested, interesting in your case, I, th I heard, and maybe you can, you can answer that for me and then Erwin will take over with the, with the situation in Austria. Um, because I'm thinking a lot uh, about also citizens assemblies and, and stuff like that. And you had you have citizens assemblies in in Ireland as um, and I think this is also a great way. Um, and we've seen that in France, for example, with the citizens assembly on climate that um, people actually come up with uh, relatively good t demands on the climate if they are informed, if they are well um, introduced to the subjects. And this is also something I would be interested to hear from you, how you see those citizens assemblies and also how you see them compared to an instrument that I'm talking about now. Um, sure. I mean, we, we did have, uh, we've had two citizen assemblies over the last decade and uh, one of them did address and, um, as, as you said, and this seems to have been the pattern elsewhere, when a citizens' assembly has time to, to deliberate an expert input, they do come back with quite an ambitious pro-action uh, it's then they then kind of decide what progresses and what doesn't. And um, so I was asking about how to uh, get citizens initiative introduced and introducing a citizen initiative process was uh, endorsed by quite a large majority in both cases. And the uh, person we have here just hasn't been advancing it at all. It just hasn't been progressing it, even though it was like one of the most Popular. Wait, I, I, I understand just half of what you're saying. So can you can you uh, say that again? The thing that you said now that the I, I just heard that the majority of people um, um, were for those those kinds of in instruments. Um, and can you take off from there? Yeah, but maybe there's a problem with my microphone. I was um, I was saying that the citizens' assemblies did support uh, a binding citizens' initiative. But the, but all of the proposals of the citizens' assembly goes back to the parliament. So if that's how the citizens' assembly is set up, it kind of just leaves it back to the politicians who could decide not to advance something if it doesn't suit them. Yeah. So um, I would kind of like I would like to see citizens' assemblies and citizen initiatives and whatever instruments can lead to more direct democracy. I kind of think you need to have these things happening on a few fronts. So there, there are advantages to doing it the deliberative way, but it, it can still kind of lead to the same problem where if the parliament, if, if it then is the job of the parliament to decide what to do with their deliberations, they could just decide to stall it however good the deliberations were. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But Evan, can you 
maybe um, get into details on when this was introduced in Austria, because I don't know about the history of that instrument. Wait, Erwin, we, we can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Oh, yeah, now. Yes. Uh, so uh, just say a few words about the history of uh, the citizen initiative uh, and the, the act about the citizen initiative in Austria. In general, in Austria, we have a constitution which reads back to 1920, and it was already at this time uh, in the Austrian constitution. But the act about this to, to make it practicable uh, then was issued um, only in, in, the, in the early 60s. And the very first citizen initiative uh, was in 1964. And uh, up to now, we had um, 50 citizens initiatives in Austria, but very, very rare. Uh, the parliament decided uh, the demands. If, uh, you have to go back to the 60s. Uh, there were some, and uh, but you can count, count them um they're really uh, successful you can count them on a few fingers and this is actually the big problem because not only is it not binding but people lose their um their faith in those instruments if they see that so many good initiatives and good demands have been brought forward and people actually signed on them and they surpass those 100,000 signatures and not that the politicians um, were not acting upon them. So I think this is also something that we want, like after the process and when we know how this um, is going to work out in the end, that we want to address more is also that I think in Austria we have we do not have very good instruments of direct democracy at, at all. So I think a citizen's initiative is a good tool and it's a useful tool in, in some respect. But I think if politicians do not act on it for a long time, then people just lose hope in those instruments. And I think this is a, is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, there are, um, Paul saying that uh, three-fourths of the Austrian population wants a uh, strong direct democracy, uh, but our politicians up to now do not uh, act on that. And there was uh, a few years ago uh, um, in the parliament uh, an enquete commission, uh, which is uh, a long-lasting event with uh, meetings ev uh, every month where we discussed uh, each and every um, detail of a direct of direct democracy but again here uh, the outcome was more or less nothing and uh, over the decades there were several discussions uh, to implement strong direct democracy but up to now it was not uh, fruitful but of course we do not give up and we hope that uh, sometime uh, that will uh, improve and, uh, and we, we will uh, be successful. But what we do have to add there, uh, the situation uh, to discuss about direct democracy was already much better in the past. There was uh, the Brexit referendum, which did, which was really not good for, for the discussion. And, uh, about uh, improving direct democracy and uh, also um, the, the far right parties uh, also demanding uh, direct democracy uh, that was not that was not helpful at all. Uh, we need to bring it back to to, to the stage of. Uh, Discussion currently there is not much discussion about improving direct democracy, and one way could could be to uh, to restart the discussion um, with uh, citizens' assemblies. Um, I re I I read a question that was posted 
um, longer ago asking me if there was a time limit um, on the citizens initiatives. And I just wanted to quickly answer that. Thank you for the question. Um, there is um, a time limit, um, but you have two phases of a citizens initiative. The first phase is actually there to kind of surpass 8,401 signatures, which, which was um, at, I think, one point of time, 1% um, uh, uh, of our po uh, population. Um, so you have to surpass that in order to actually um, officially put forward the citizens initiative. So that first period, but this can be prolonged over a long, longer period of time. But the, once you have actually um, submitted your citizens initiative, um, there is only one week to collect the signatures. So you have this time that time span that you can prolong for, for a longer period of time. And you are also able to, or you can also collect more signatures in that first period of time. And then as soon as you hand it in, you have one week um, to collect more. Um, yeah, I see Dono still has his hand raised. Dono, would you like to say anything else? Uh, would you like to ask another question perhaps? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, Katrina, thank you very, or Katharina, thank you very much for that excellent presentation and congratulations on your success with the Klima um, uh, movement Austria. in Austria. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm the person who asked the question about the time limit. I just want to ask another question given the answer you've given. Um, so the first thing you have to do is collect 1% of the um, uh, of the citizens' signatures, get signatures of about 1% of the citizens. And that can, you can take, if I've understood you correctly, as much time as you like to get those signatures. And, and I mean, it's, 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 um, it's not as much time as I like, but it's a long time span. So um, okay. if, if I would, for example, um, started on the 1st um, of January 2020, I could collect until the end of 2022. So um, it's, no, 2021. So it's um, the, the most time that you get is two years. Yes. If you would put it forward in June, you have one and a half years. So it's, it's only till the end of the, the, next, the next year. So the, the the longest time span that you get is two years for this. A second question, and then I want to make a comment, uh, Ryan, or if you don't mind, on Ireland where I live. Um, the second question is, when you gather signatures first in the, can they then be counted when you actually formally submit the, um, the uh, petition, sorry, the initiative to whoever you have to submit it to, and and so therefore they are counted in the signatures where you only have a week to actually yes. collect them. Yes, they are counted to the, the additional signatures that you, you collect in a week. I think um, at first this was it, just like a formal thing that you wanted to surpass the, the 8,000 signatures, but your question aims at the thing that is happening now with many of the of the citizens initiatives is that they just prolong the first stage in order to then collect most of the signatures and the one week um, yeah, gives them additional signatures, but this is not as important. Um, the thing that happens though with this one week is that um, the government is, uh, um, is obliged to uh, give information out to the citizens. So before it's only your responsibility to get your information out to, to as many people as you can reach. And in this one week, there is actually um, a, a law that, um, that says that all local authorities have to inform the citizens um, that uh, there is a citizens initiative happening in that week. That, um, that works well in some <laughs> in some states and, and not so well in others, but it's actually law. And this is also why this week is is not unimportant because it may reach 
people that you through your own channels cannot reach. And the other question then arising from that is I understand in, Swiss, in, in Austria, people must go to a formal public office to lodge the signature. You, yeah. As you indicate, you can't collect. I want to make a comment if I may, Reiner, and if I'm going on too long, stop me. On our experience in the Republic of Ireland of citizens assemblies, as, as Jonathan pointed out, we've had two. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, they got a lot of publicity for two matters relating to sex. One was that the first one um, uh, passed a motion in favor of same-sex marriage, and the second one uh, came out in favor of repealing an amendment brought into our 1937 constitution banning abortion. That was only brought in uh, in 1983. They got a lot of publicity for that. What they did not get publicity for is that the first citizens assembly, which went from uh, 2014, I think, to 2016, passed 18 measures that would call for referendums. Only three of those have been put to um, uh, in referendums. And in our country, referendums, as in Austria, can only be initiated by effectively the government or the parliament. One of the measures they did pass was a, as Jonathan said, a measure in, in favor of very strong or of, of uh, direct democracy, binding direct democracy. And that was passed by that assembly and also by the second assembly uh, by bigger majorities than voted in favor of um, either same-sex marriage or voted for uh, the abortion, changing the abortion referendum. The point I make here is that you can have as many citizens assembly as you like, but they are top-down measures. Our citizens assembly were set up by resolutions in the parliament with the terms of reference. Through some fluke or other, Citizens' Initiative was not in the terms of reference for the first uh, assembly, but they were considering the voting system and the members decided as part of that in response to submissions made of which I, I made some uh, to consider direct democracy, although it was not a formal part of the agenda. It, it became a formal part of the agenda in the second uh, Citizens' Assembly because the parliament specified the manner in which referendums are held. So it was easy enough to make an argument that, you know, what I'm really saying is that if you have a top-down citizens assembly, as we've seen in most countries, where the agenda is specified by, let's say, the current existing powers that be, um, you're left with, depending on the same powers that be, to actually implement what what will come out of that, because that's the way these citizens' assembly are advisory, basically. Mm -hmm. They are maybe, to some extent, agenda setting. Mm -hmm. And the promise is the same as the one that you have in Austria with your assembly. They will consider it in parliament. Mm -hmm. They will consider it if they feel like it, but they're not, no, the existing powers that be are not going to hand over power uh, of initiative on legislation uh, or, or even a veto proposal. Uh, and I think we have to accept that. And that's why I welcome what Anne Hart has just pointed out that campaigning for direct democracy is something that um, people like us have to learn. And I'm intrigued to hear from, from Irwin that um, your original citizens' assembly or citizens' initiative was in your uh, constitution of 1920. When we became uh, independent of Britain in the same era, our first constitution had provisions for direct democracy, including citizens' initiative, binding citizens' initiative. Um, there was a new constitution, I won't go into the detail, that was taken out of the constitution in the late 20s, when a new constitution was written in the 30s, uh, it, it did not make it into it. The only thing that was left there was the, um, that, the referendum, the referendum is needed in order to change the constitution. That's the only thing, but the referendums are always initiated by the public authorities, in other words, the government and or the parliament. Um, so sorry for going on so long, but I, I just wanted to um, clarify that. 
that citizens' assemblies, which are very fashionable, uh, I think, um, need to be looked at very carefully. Thank you very much. That's a very good and fair point. And I think, um, as you have pointed out in the chat, there is also a link um, to a workshop on campaigning for direct democracy. So if any of you want to learn more about that, um, join that. And also Erwin, uh, maybe you can point out that there will be another session on Friday, I think on, on citizens assemblies, where I think voices like yours uh, highly welcome and I, I think this is a very good point to be discussed because as with any instruments as you pointed out if it's just by um, just going back into parliament um, and just being discussed there then um, many of them are not as powerful as they could be and as democratic as they could be in the in the way they could be theoretically set up. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Thanks for your answers. It's been very interesting. Um, so I would like to go, there was a, Andreas has a, has a question, but I also want to go back to Gerard uh, Schuster's comment. Gerard, yeah, would you want to add something? Hello, um, would, would you like to add anything to your comment about bio, biodiversity and about the biodiversity initiative in, 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 in Bavaria? Or would you want to just leave it the way it is? Um, should, should I read it? Yeah, um, I think this example of the Bavarian initiative on biodiversity shows very good that that uh, the way the, the process of direct democracy in a binding way could uh, change uh, things. And, and, but we don't have these uh, good processes of direct democracy. We don't have it in Austria, we don't have it in German. We have it in some countries. We just heard a little bit about um, Ireland. And I think this is a long fight to to get to this, um, to, to get real democracy, because in our opinion, real democracy is a complementary democracy. It's, it's representative pillar and the direct pillar. We need both pillars for, for a real democracy. And, and my appeal always is for, the, for, for changes like the climate uh, situation, for big changes. I think that the 21st century will be a century of a, a big ecological revolution and, and, and it will change everything in, in our uh, um, world situation, global situation. It will change everything. And, and we need to, to uh, shape this change together with all people. And I think this should be a good reason for the, for the ecological movement to be also part of the democratic movement the movement for people's legislation, because I think we, 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 we have to, and, and the, the democracy question is a question of all people, the same as, as the question for our climate and our ecological situation. And we are responsible for our future. And, and, and I think it's the same for fighting for real democracy is the same like fighting for the rights for for, for, the, for women rights and, and, and all these emancipatory processes we, we fight the, the last 200 or 300 years. And this is my, <laughs> my wish and my, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your contribution, Gerard. Now I'm gonna ask Andreas, do you want, would you like to ask, to ask your question in person or? Yes, of course. Um, yes, hi, and uh, thank you for this great presentation. And uh, again, congratulations to the great success. Um, what I was wondering, and I mean, uh, we already heard about the Bavarian initiatives. We have the, the uh, Citizen Assembly in France, but all over the world, there are a lot of initiatives on climate, which is great. Uh, but I sometimes have the feeling also from my perspective here in Germany that there's a lot of local initiatives, but they are not really connected. They're working sometimes really lonely and doing a great work. So my question is more, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. Is there an international, like European at least, cooperation, experience, learnings, 
which you share with others. I, um, I mean, we have now, as I've seen, the Fridays of Future have an European Citizen Initiative, which is, I think, yeah, there are some initiatives on, on climate or at least on biodiversity and so on, uh, also from uh, on the European level. But yeah, I think this is something I still missing that from this movement all over the world is coming out something more, you know, policy orientated, political or using these instruments which are already there. So maybe you have an idea or have some experience with that. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, you are right to some extent. Um, but this is also, I think, um, the reason for not being super, super connected is also that most of the new climate movement is only there since two years. So before that, of course, we have um, global cooperation between um, between environmental NGOs and, and Greenpeace is operating internationally. But for example, with Fridays for Future, this was just a movement that was uh, grassroots and, and, and kind of popping up all over the world. And um, for, for Fridays for Future, I know that uh, we are relatively connected in, within the movement, also with the movement in Germany, for example, with the movement in Switzerland, so the German speaking countries are, are super connected and also the European um, initiatives are relatively well connected, but for their purposes. So this was the first step that we had to take is to connect us for this um, global climate strike. And as you said before, there is a European citizens initiative, but this was not something that was a collaboration of many of those groups. So I think this is the next step that we have to do to also um, connect those um, those initiatives that are more policy focused um, and, or, or put them forward also as Fridays for Future movements or together with um, large scale NGOs. Um, so I think you're right, the connection or the, the, the um, yeah, the partnership is not as strong as it could be. It's very focused on the um, on the tool you use. So the Fridays for Future movements are relatively, um, yeah, they, they partner up for the global climate strikes, for example. But there are also other tools um, that we didn't mention um, up to now, which would be, for example, the, um, the climate lawsuits that are going on around the world. I know that there is one in Austria now that is been put forward by Greenpeace, but those are individual uh, lawsuits that has ha have, um, have been brought uh, to court. And I know that those initiatives are also connected, but just for their lawsuits and, and stuff like that. So it's relatively um, tool focused at the moment, I think, the connections. But yeah, that, that will be the next step I think to also connect them for um, specific policy changing purposes or also tools for direct democracy um, which has not really happened yet I think. Okay thank you so much for your answer. Now is there anyone else who'd like to raise their hand? Uh, Evan, yeah, over to you, Evan. I'm Liada Irwin of Austria, so don't mix us up. Mm -hmm. um, today we had a press conference together with uh, Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future on exactly the topic. We're demanding a citizens' assembly on climate change in Austria. And we connected to direct democracy in the way similar France did it because I don't know if you have already mentioned, Macron uh, promised that the, that, the, that the participants of the, uh, the citizens assembly can formulate a law uh, helped by, by lawyers. And then this proposal could be brought one-to-one -one without, he said, with no filter to the parliament and be directly decided in the parliament or the people or the participants can decide that the proposals, that the recommendations of the citizens' assembly go to a referendum, a binding referendum. The only difference to Austria is uh, that the referendum law is uh, linked to the president in France, 
And in Austria, it's a right for, uh, for the parliament. Uh, and you ask if we work together inter on an international uh, way, we try. And especially XR has this third demand for citizens assembly for a long time. And for example, we took the UK, uh, was it a description for citizens assembly? And it was translated to Germany. So there is a German uh, uh, guide for citizens assembly existing. And in Austria, we took up this guide and made a special guide for held uh, for holding uh, citizen assemblies on climate change. So this international collaboration is existing to some extent, but as Katharina said, strongly focusing on some tools. It's not really a European or worldwide movement until now, working together on the climate fields and on the uh, direct democracy field. That's it. And I will give you the, the pictures as far the moment I have it from the press conference and from the very nice tie-in we had. Right. Thank you so much for your contribution, Evan. Um, now, yeah, um, any other questions from any of the participants? Um, yes, I, I would like to ask something actually. Um, I mean, yeah, your citizens initiative was incredibly successful, but was there something that you would have done differently looking back? Uh, yeah, there are, <laughs> there are many things actually, I think. Um, um, looking back, I think we were not at all prepared what it means in Austria to do a citizens initiative. As I said before, we were aware that we needed alliances in order to bring that forward, but I only um, realized how much it needs to um, reach so many people after we started it. So for example, before our citizens initiative, um, three years before, I think two and a half years, there was um, a citizens initiative on um, on banning smoking in public places. Uh, we were one of the last countries to do that, by the way. <laughs> and there was a citizens initiative on that and they actually collected 800,000 signatures, which is a lot. But they also had a budget of 2 million and like a whole list of organizations be behind them. So I think this is also one of the critical points in citizens initiatives at the moment that it is super hard for them to be really bottom up and to be really a grassroots thing um, as yeah as, as I said they had a budget of two millions and I think five people working 40 hour jobs on those citizens initiatives and we were just like a bunch of I mean we were thousands of thousands of uh, 1000 volunteers but we still kind of did that in our free time and we had a budget of i think all in all it was at the end um uh yeah close to like 100,000 euros which is not a lot for a national campaign and um so this is one of the the things that i realized in the hindsight is that we were not really prepared uh, for the instruments in, in itself. And I think what I would have probably changed as well is um, to take more time designing those phases differently um, because we started off with with a campaign that we didn't really think through and we didn't know how long this first phase would take for us because in between that there was a re-election and that changed things politically and um, I think what I would do now is to really um, start the citizens initiative like one year ahead really plan it through get 
many organizations on board beforehand, plan the campaign with them and get as many experts as I can um, that are familiar with campaigning, that are familiar with also um, building up an organization. As I said, we were 1000 um, volunteers in the end and we are a new organization. So organizing all of this, and um, putting up an institutional structure and not losing information in between those groups and stuff like that was super, super hard for us. Um, and I think, yeah, putting more time and thinking in such a tool in advance would have been good. But I think it was just like also, I mean, coming from the climate movement everything has to be very fast and we are all young and we want to do things so we just took <laughs> took that instrument and we we thought we we're going to do it which is probably also a good thing but i think in hindsight it would have been good to plan more things thoroughly <laughs> than to just do it Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, because you mentioned your your budget, and how did you how did you do that? Like, did you collect donations most yeah, of the time? How did it donation. work? And only yeah. donate and mostly small donations, or I think I think the average donation was twenty five euros. Oh. So it was mostly small donations, mostly by individual people um, from yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Anna. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I would also want to ask another question from my side. Anyone that has an urgent question? Um, all right, yeah, so I, I, I just want to ask another question and sort of, um, yeah, I'm interested to know, I mean, it's good if you if you can go a bit behind the scenes of the initiative, what was the sort of participation like? Were Was it mostly young people? What was the demographic of the people that signed? So, you know, uh, just for interest sake. That's a very good question. Um, so coming from the Fridays for Future background, which is a re relatively young demographic. I mean, now um, it kind of changed as well with, um, with alliances like Parents for Future, Scientists for Future, um, Teachers for Future and stuff like that. So there are alliances that um, are an older demographic, but it started off as a very young movement. But the Klima Volks began was from the start um, a little bit broader in, in the demographic. So we had hardly any um, school students. We had some university students. Most of the people were working. Um, so we had a lot of people who did that in their free time um, next to their normal everyday work. Um, many of them had children. Um, we have a lot of people actually that uh, started their, their pensions now and then now they have free time and want to do something. So it's, I think um, uh, it's, it's also different um, in the regional groups that you look at. For example, in Vienna, it's mostly university students that actually led our local hub. And in other, in other um, counties or in other um, in other states, it was more, yeah, working people or even, yeah, older people, 60 plus. So it, it also changed with, uh, with the location you would be looking at. But it was, in the end, I think it was relatively broad. And I think if I, if I would have to guess, because I, did, I, I don't know it exactly, but if I would have to guess, I think the, the average age is like 35, 40 something. All right. Um, yeah, thanks so much for your answer. And um, it's very interesting. I see a comment here from Donald O'Bro here, and he says uh, your success is an example of the maxim that, it, that if you want something new, different, difficult done, hand it over to young people because they do not know it cannot be done. So <laughs> I thought that was a very uh, interesting comment. That's a very nice comment. And I think you are right, because I, I mean, 
my answer to Anne was um, was was heartfelt, but I also think that nobody else would have done it because I talked to organizations like uh, Greenpeace and other environmental NGOs after that, and they wouldn't have touched those democratic instruments um, because they feared that they would um, that too few people would sign and that it would be actually bad for the climate movement. And I think with our um, maybe naive thought in mind that there can be nothing that is counterproductive, but everything we do is productive for, for the issue. Um, we actually have done something that maybe some other people wouldn't have um, started. So thanks for your comment. <laughs> I think Erwin wants to say something. Yeah. yeah, I just want to comment and afterwards maybe a very critical question. First to comment, maybe I myself or my doing as a campaigner with Greenpeace was the reason for the skepticism on uh, citizen initiatives in Austria because I was the last one, the spokesperson for the citizen initiative against uh, nuclear power in Europe. This was the aim of the last Greenpeace citizen initiative. And at that time we had a much bigger budget as you said, I think about about 1 million euro <laughs> and about 20 to 30 staff people worked for one year on this citizen initiative. And in the end we had about 130,000 uh, signatures. So it was enough to bring it to the parliament but nothing more. But at that time, at least the Greens supported it and they supported direct democracy that we improve direct democracy in Austria. And that's now coming to the, to the, to the critical point. Uh, in the evening, we will discuss with European Greens and German Greens, if the Greens still support direct democracy or not. And if you look at the, at, at the Green Party and, and the program for the election, they are still in favor of direct democracy and they explicitly mention citizen assemblies. And to, they want to make both to improve citizen initiative to make it more binding and they want to have citizen uh, citizen assemblies but if you look at the coalition treaty of austria between the conservatives and the green not one word is mentioned on direct democracy or citizens initiatives or citizen assemblies and erwin leitner and me have looked at the last at least last five coalition treaties and there have been always promises to improve direct democracy and democracy and citizen initiatives, etc. In this coalition treaty was the first one, it was not even mentioned. So we don't know, to be honest, and I'm a, Greens by my, a Green Party member by myself, if the Greens are still in favor of direct democracy and if they are behind citizens' assemblies and they want to make it more binding or not. So this is unclear. And as you know, the, 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 the climate uh, citizen initiative started by, by some Greens. And, and then I was very, very happy that you took it over <laughs> and it became much more independent. And uh, also the demands, they, they, they were not fine at the, at the beginning, but afterwards they were very fine. And I, saw, and I signed it, of course I signed it. So, but this is the, this, the, the difficult relation between direct democracy, climate change and the Greens. So the Greens are completely behind climate change demands, but they are not 100% behind direct democracy or citizens assemblies. So this is a big task for us for all together to work on, but maybe you can comment it. Um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that you know more of their position on on citizens assemblies now and as you're, you are the, the expert on it. Um, but I think um, I think what I have noticed in uh, in my uh, in speaking with with politicians in general is um, that it's very split, like in 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 one person. So on the one hand, I think nobody. I, I mean, there are some some people, but I think nobody would say, "Hey, it's unimportant what people think." So at the one hand, they always say it's so important that people stand up, that people are political, that people sign, for example, citizens initiatives, that the voices of people are heard. But as you said, um, 
if it comes to certain tools, if it comes to um, more binding um, tools as well, it's very, very, very hard to, um, to get something through. And this is also connected to what Donald said before. I think there are citizens assemblies set up in a way that are not catering the, the, the thing that you want to make them more binding, but they are also like the citizens initiatives, non-binding, they're just being discussed in parliament. And I think um, those how those things are set up uh, is a very important point. And I totally agree with you that we have to further that and to further that on every level, because I think it's not only for um, national uh, citizens assemblies, but also, and probably more critically also to design your own county, to design your own city, to be part of what happens there. And I think um, connecting also those levels would be super, super beneficial because um, this also happened um, in Barcelona with uh, with Ada Colau and 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 like their citizens assemblies that were very local citizens assemblies and I think those things can actually really empower people to be part of a change and um, but you're right it's very very hard to get people to get politicians to actually um, make them into better and 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 yeah more binding tools than they are now. Um, all right, thank you so much, um, Katarina. Um, yeah, so I think is that I just want to ask around again if anyone else has a question. Evan, uh, Evan, would you perhaps like to add anything to what Katarina just said, um, or or not? Uh, well, there was I think a question which I did not answer by now it was the question when. Uh, um, the panel will be with Erwin Meyer, and I had a look, I had a quick look, it will be on Friday on four o'clock, and it will have the title, Com uh, Complementary Path to Combating uh, Climate Change. There you can hear um, Erwin Meyer and, uh, it, and also John Bunzel, and it will also uh, be about uh, citizens' assent. All right, that yeah, brilliant. And uh, yeah, so I just want to mention as well, we spoke about youth involvement today um, in this panel, but also our next panel discussion, we will be joined by by the people from organizers from Fridays for Future, and it's uh, also by Achim Wölfel from Mehr Demokratie uh, in, in Germany. So we, we've we been joined by Mehr Demokratie uh, Austria, and now we're also going to be joined by Mehr Demokratie Germany, and then we're going to discuss a lot of the, a lot of these issues surrounding youth involvement and also the possibilities that youth involvement um, gives us. So um, yeah, I think I just want to yeah, I just want to um, also and then furthermore we also have another. I mean we have an, this is the first panel of the day. We have three more coming. So the next one is youth involvement. Then we have two more, which is um, we're also doing a one on cycling. So that's also an initiative that was started over here locally in Germany to improve um, cycling lanes and, and infrastructure surrounding cycling, which is definitely not one to miss. We'll, it's going to be taking place tonight, which um, from that, that one will be from 1830 to, to, to uh, eight o'clock Central European time. And then also, finally, our final session of the day is the challenges of elections and direct democracy in Mexico in times of COVID-19, which is also very interesting. And it's going to give us a perspective of the challenges people are facing, um, which is, you know, not necessarily in Europe, but in, an, in, in, um, in another, on another continent. So um, in another country. Yeah. So thank you. I just want to thank Katarina again from um, climate, um, from, from um, yeah, the climate initiative, uh, Austria. And I'd like to thank Erwin Leitner, uh, the founder of uh, Mayor Democracy Austria as well. And then also Erwin Meyer, the spokesperson for Mayor Democracy Austria. And yeah, I think that's 
I think we're going to conclude our session for to, for 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 um for now, and then I hope you join us later as well for our other fascinating panels. So thank you all very much, and um, we hope to see you later today again. Bye. Bye. Bye.